It can uplift, connect, and lighten the mood, creating unforgettable moments. But in the world of business, it can also be a double-edged sword. When does a joke bolster your point in a conversation and presentation, and when does it fall flat, potentially even offending? How can we harness the power of laughter to foster better relationships with colleagues and clients without crossing unseen boundaries? And that's what we're talking about today on Mark Hain Live. Welcome to this episode. This is where small business owners and entrepreneurs develop new skills to help them create the jaw-dropping, show-stopping experience that their customers and their employees deserve. I am your host, customer and employee experience strategist, Mark Hain. I am so glad that you are here with me today because this is going to be a really fun conversation. My guest is a very funny woman, Susan Carter and together we will be navigating the intricate dance of communication ensuring that our humor resonates in all the right ways. If this is your first time with us I invite you to check out the other other episodes on this podcast. Uh, each one is chock full of information and learnings that you can apply to your business. Not all of them are as funny as this one is going to be but what the heck. <laughs> You know, if you've ever watched The Office, uh, you would have undoubtedly cringed at the lead character, Michael Scott's attempt to be funny and be liked through the use of humor, many times to absolute disastrous effect. In a world where every word can make or break a deal, how do you toe the line between humor that engages and humor that offends? Are we missing out on the power of well-timed jokes and potentially stepping on conversational landmines? Well, that brings us to our question of the day. Have you ever experienced a moment where humor either saved or sank a situation at work? I'd love for you to share your story. Share your story down below in the comments. I'd love for you to be part of this conversation. If you want to take it one step further, share this episode on your favorite social media platform, hashtag it experienced leadership, and let's share a little bit about where it went right and where did it go wrong. <laughs> As I mentioned, my guest today speaks all over the country. Susan Carter holds a Bachelor of Education from the University of Regina and has taught in four provinces. In 1993, at the ripe age of 40, she decided to act on a long-time dream of doing stand-up comedy. And guess what? People laughed! <laughs> Susan realized she could sell ideas so much better when she incorporated humor, especially in the classroom where the attention spans are as fleeting as your phone battery life. You could have sworn it was 100% a minute ago and suddenly, like that, it's down to 2%. <laughs> Susan, welcome to the show. It's so great to have you. Thank you. You do realize that you've given everybody the mathematical equation to figure out how exactly old I am. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> no worries. Don't thank me. It's all public service. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> yeah, I just think it was really just, I had to mention how old you were when you started doing stand-up because that's magical that you yeah. did something you dreamed of for so long and you decided yeah. at 40 was a good time to do it. So well done. Thank you. I, I personally just could not have stood up in front of people and accepted criticism as a young woman. I needed right. to have some experience. I needed to get over the fact that, you know, people will criticize you. So that's yeah. how it worked for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love it. Um, before we get into today's topic, could you tell us a little bit about how you serve your clients? Well, when I do a workshop for corporate, uh, for teachers, it's always with the idea in mind that we have to figure out what kind of humor is out there, what kind of humor you're capable of doing, and actually telling 
self-deprecating stories. So that's the one key to all of this. Those stories have to be about yourself to go over well. And there's sarcasm, all these rude things that are out there. And there was a period of time where everybody was saying, just kidding. No, oh, you weren't. No, yeah. Yeah. that's not that's not a joke and that's not going to save you when you say just kidding no what, um, you can't take a joke yeah yeah <laughs> don't say it <laughs> yeah i i've you know i've been in many workplaces that seem to really be devoid of a sense of ha ha um especially i i even notice it as a customer it's like people here don't seem like they're having a good they don't seem like they're having fun how important is it to inject levity into our corporate cultures? Well, I just feel that, uh, first of all, you, you need to have a knowledge of, of what can be acceptable to everyone and start small and build on it. If like so many guys will get a, and I, I look at the male situation because when I hung out at Yuck Yucks, that's all pretty well. That was, I did manage to run into three other females, but mostly a male dominated place. And they've been getting away with the things they've been getting away with for so long <laughs> that they don't realize there's other people around. Yeah. That, you know, I alluded, I, I alluded to the, to the office. Um, you know, when I started watching the office, I, it was like, I loved it so much because it was kind of like watching a car wreck. You just couldn't pull uh -huh. yourself away from it. Uh -huh. And the character, Michael Scott, of course, which is, uh, you know, just the driver behind the whole show. Uh, he tries so hard when, when you look at an episode where he's tried hard and it falls flat, where, where do you think he as a character is dropping the ball? I have no idea because I never watched that show. <laughs> You've never watched The Office? As a comedian, you haven't watched The Office? No. Uh, no, okay. I, I have to tell you why. Um, I quit watching comedy and comedians and stand-ups especially because I had this, um, I don't know, strange genetic part in my brain where I would copy them. And mm. I didn't want to be seen as somebody else. Mm. Um Rita Rudner is a stand-up out of Vegas, or she was, and I just loved her so much that I started to sound like Rita Rudner. So I just quit watching a lot of things. I did. I oh, did. Well, that's perfectly fine. Um, for anybody watching the show, I watching, uh, tuning in today, I, I strongly recommend that you watch a few episodes of The Office because from a <laughs> leadership perspective, you're going to learn yeah. a lot of things of what not to do and it's, it's a goofy shoe it's a very goofy show and first when i first watched it i thought this is ridiculous this is so stupid and i and i wouldn't watch it but then i watched it over my daughter's shoulder she was watching it on her on her ipad and and i thought oh my goodness this is actually really well done and i just got addicted yeah. to it um, yeah. just because there's so much components in there and so the character i'm alluding to um, is a manager he wants to be liked and he thinks that the way to get liked is to make jokes all the time and he's always joking with stuff and it always kinds of crosses that line yeah. to being yeah. inappropriate but mm -hmm. in 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 our corporate culture do you do you think that a lack of humor might be kind of this invisible wall between might help break down the invisible wall between teams and and departments is is there something there well when you're working with other people you have to be very cautious when you jump in and you are actually studying them for to see what they like and what they find funny. And I always find in any situation, you're going to find somebody who has the same sense of humor as you. And then there's all sorts of people that you can see by the little <laughs> wheels in their mind, it's going over their head or under them, whatever. So as you have to be very cautious in your dealings with people, especially when you first meet them. It's like when you're a stand-up, my theory is it's like meeting somebody for the first time. And I'm not going to start making jokes about you when I first meet you. The, how nuts is that? So you can just caution. And 
I'm just saying that word cautious over overall, cautiously start watching other people and seeing what their humor is. And you'll find that um, two guys, I had two teachers I worked with, and we were all three of us teaching the same subject. And they just were on the same page all the time, all the time. And I became a bit of an outcast. And I kind of went along with it. I knew what was happening. But that was fine with me because my humor and their humor was totally different. So when I worked with them, I just worked with them on a serious note. This is business. We're going to do this, this, and this. And that's as far as it went. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think, you know, it seems like, you know, of course, we had, you know, the Chris Rock and Will Smith issue on at the award show where uh, Will Smith took exception to it. We're hearing time and time again now that people are starting to throw stuff at, at acts on the stage and taking personal offense wow. to jokes. Yeah. In, in this area of DEI, uh, bias avoidance and so on, are we crossing into a landmine with humor, would it just be safer not to bother and just make sure we're politically correct 100% of the time? Well, that's no fun. But, it's not. but, but again, it's not everybody is funny and right. it's just the way it is. And so humor might not be part of your makeup. Right. And I, I, I was taught to be funny. And in an age where women weren't supposed to be funny, my father encouraged it at home. My dad is, well, I think he's funny. He's 95. Maybe that's just funny. I don't know. But he encouraged humor in my house. And uh, we got special points if we could make my mom laugh. Uh, we got um, major bonus points if she lost her teeth. So that was just kind of things we did in our house. And my dad sang parody songs, so I sing parody songs. It's just, I was raised that way. And it took me a long time to realize that, especially back then, now that everybody knows how old I am, especially back then, women weren't encouraged to be funny. And right. to, a, to a certain extent, that's still going on women are not allowed to be funny. And it's interesting because it's inter very. because you said that and we'll get into kind of the gender humor uh, after the break. But, you know, this this idea that, you know, when people are, are dating, right, it's like, what well, what do you like in the perfect woman? And, you know, they have to they have to be able to laugh at my jokes. And when you look at women, oh, he has wow. to have a sense of humor. And, right? and it's no. like, hmm, one of them is like a passive kind of thing. He has to laugh at my jokes. And the other one is I got to create the jokes. Yeah. yeah, that's right. That's right. Now, my husband is very funny, but he never pushes himself to be the center of attention. And you have to know him really well to get that. But like he always says, he's writing my jokes for me sometimes. You know, especially if he's mad about something and I pull out the piece of paper and start writing it down, he's quit writing that down. And then at the show, he'll say, that was my joke. And it, and it is, but yeah. it's my ability to observe that. And, and he never, he never uh, wants the center stage either. Right. So it works well for us. And I was always Mm, not always, but I was funnier than a lot of the guys I dated, and that ended the relationship very quickly. Ha! Huh. Men with no sense of humor. Can you stand it? <laughs> uh, it because uh, men are in competition over humor. Wow. And, and when you join that competition, that's a whole new thing for them. They don't get it. That's yeah. not the way life is. Yeah, you know, I was lucky because I, because I grew up with a mom who was very much a wordsmith. She loved words. And so mm -hmm. we had like the punniest household ever because we tried to out pun each other constantly. Yeah. Right. Yeah, like it's... we'd be sitting around and all of us jumping on puns. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's right. I, mm -hmm. Go on. 
No, I agree with you totally. It's how you're raised and what you're allowed to do in the household. Mm. I, I had a neighbor down the street. Her dad's humor was mean. Oh. And I was, because we were the same age and we hung out together, I was over there and I observed that and I didn't like him. He was mean, but she developed the skill of kind of simpering and haha, daddy, you're so funny. That was her skill. And she rose up very high and I, I won't tell you who she is, but um, she was able to manage that, but she wasn't allowed to be funny herself. Right. It's interesting. You know, I'd really love to get into, you've been alluding to the, um, to the kind of gender uh, or gendered humor. Uh, I'd like to uncover some of the humor basics, especially the gendered humor, and how to bridge the gaps between the humor, uh, between the sexes, between different people, and we'll get to that right after this. When the spotlight shines on your business, are customers applauding or yawning? In other words, how is your business performing? Make your business a star with a new book, Lights, Camera, Action, Business Operational Excellence Through the Lens of Live Theater by Mark Hain. Mark uses his business and acting experience to help you see your business like a live show so you can create a performance your customers will never forget. Buy Lights, Camera, Action today at your favorite online retailer or directly at markhain.com. I gave it to him and the penguin said, wait a minute, this is not lemon flavored in the snow cone. Okay, whatever. Oh, welcome back. I am here with Susan Carter, and we're talking about humor in communications and in our workplaces. Uh, it's always a lot of fun because I love humor, and you know, there's uh, it's something that I you know I know that if if we're not laughing a lot at work, then we're not having fun. But um, as you alluded to before the break, there's a lot of differences between female humor versus male humor. Can we dig a little bit into that? What do women find funny compared to what men are finding funny? Uh, well, let's start with bathroom humor, my favorite topic. Um, my husband, I said to him at one point, I said, when do men get over bathroom humor? And he said, never. And I thought, okay, got it. Uh, women always kind of, they laugh, but they tisk. Oh, tisk. Oh, sorry. Right. Um, but they're with it because they've been trained to go with that. And so that's always something. And when women are performing on stage, let's talk about Yuck Yucks because that's a very blue place. And I worked there. I, I didn't work as a paid comic, but I trained there. And men can get away with so much, I'll just say, dirty stuff. And when the women start doing that, the other women don't like it. And the men don't like it either. And it's just kind of an uncomfortable thing. I mean, things may be changing, but I just find it it's really uncomfortable. And I because I was teaching and doing stand up at night, I couldn't start swearing for one thing, because then I'd start swearing at the kids in school. Whether they deserved it or not, I don't know. But um, I, I kept myself clean. I kept myself really just talking about my family. But the other thing about women, women are terrible when they get together and talk. They tell you this long freaking story. I have one friend, if I interrupt her and say I've heard it before, she'll start again and tell the whole thing to the punchline anyway, whether I want to hear it or not. But it's too long. And that was the one thing I learned at Yuck Yucks. And I had a principal who did this to me too. You have to get that out of there. You know, stand up, you set people up and then you punch line so it was a way to kind of make the story shorter and and i think women just want to tell you the whole truth and nothing but the truth but it takes an hour what well, <laughs> there's only two two lines in there that are funny yeah 
I think I think yeah. it's different, um, you know, telling people stories like it lets around the water cooler and mm -hmm. doing stand up because in stand up, mm -hmm. I mean, how many laughs you get per minute count. But yes, when you're do. around the water cooler and people are engaged with your story and so on, it could be a little bit different. Yeah, that's for sure. Yeah. But it it's women are supposed to laugh at men culturally and um, men are supposed to get those laughs like you alerted to that before. And I totally agree with that. And I just don't think that's right. And I started to teach girls in my classroom how to tell stand up, like how to tell stories that were funny, because I wanted them empowered to do that. And that was the start of my workshops about working on your own story. If you have to tell a um, give a speech, you want a story in there that's about yourself. It's not about um, your wife or, uh, you know, a man. No, it's about yourself and something that happened to you that became funny. Um, so it's just workshopping how to make that a smaller story, men and women, a smaller story. And uh, hey, that's the Are way there... it goes. Are there, are there any kind of uh, cultural context that shape what we perceive as male and female humor? Or is it that we just have to... Because, I mean, there's this whole theory in comedy that you don't punch down. You can punch up. You can make fun of stuff above you. You can mm -hmm. do mm -hmm. lateral mm -hmm. um, sides. But you never, ever make fun of stuff uh, punching down to belittle people. All right. So, yeah. How, do, how does cultural context shape what we perceive as male or female humor? Yeah, well, there you go. But men have always stereotyped their wives, right? And, and as a female comic, it's great because those stereotypes aren't out there for me. I'm not, I, I would hang out with these 18-year-olds at Yuck Yucks, and they only had two jokes. Mm. Uh, sex and drugs and it was variations of those things because of course they're 18 and that's all their experience is but I as a 40 year old woman had all sorts of other things to talk about and um, those poor guys now marijuana is legal so they're just down to one <laughs> or really illicit drugs yes 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 or really illicit drugs yeah no yeah. but it's it's just interesting that um, stereotypical things are the norm and um, we laugh at them because it's normal, I guess. And like I said, that bathroom humor is always a puzzle to me. And every once in a while when I'm doing a show, I'll say something inadvertently that is a sexual nature and the guys are just killing themselves and gone over my head. I don't know what I said. <laughs> it's just funny. Because, yeah. because it was a connotation. Um, so, yeah. I mean, in in um, in person relationships within offices and that sort of thing, is there is there any any kind of topic like I mean, obviously, there are topics that are kind of, you know, like you don't talk about politics or religion or whatnot. But is, is what how can somebody judge whether or not what I'm going to say is going to be funny or not? Yeah, I guess that's it. It spews out of your mouth and then you find out. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. Don't be, oh, how do I want to say that? Don't be funnier than the boss. That's the one rule. <laughs> Never. You can't be funnier than your boss. You can't also play golf better than your boss. It's like you're, oh, you're so I marginalized. <laughs> yeah, it's terrible. <laughs> Um, Emtiaz has a question. Um, how can humor be effectively integrated into communication, especially in professional settings like business meetings or presentations? That's a good. Yeah, question. it is a good question. And I would just practice, practice uh, with everybody. And I'm one of these people that can tell stories in line uh, wherever. I was stuck in the international airport <laughs> in Toronto and was practicing some stuff because that's what I do. And then these poor people, they don't know what I'm doing. I'm telling them some story 
and then they kind of get into it and then they're with me and wherever they laugh I just go write that down and I really recommend seriously looking at your jokes to um, help them out and fix them and if you're giving a presentation or a speech you just have to put it in there and uh, break it up yeah I, I, and to that point i mean having somebody to coach you along the way might be a big help how can people get in touch with you susan if they want to maybe pick your brain hire you to help punch up a, oh, a presentation sure. how how can they get a hold of you um anybody who's computer savvy can find me <laughs> uh, but i have an email that i constantly use and that's just sc like my name is susan carter so it's sc and then another C to make comic at, at live.com. So, perfect. Yeah. Okay. Well, we did put the connection in the show notes. Ooh. So, again, okay. that uh, to MTS's question about incorporating presentations for somebody who doesn't know how to become funny. You know, one of the things yeah. that we need to do is we need to learn the skill because it is a skill and it is yeah. a science behind it. Um, tell us a little bit about your book. Your book got released in the middle of COVID. It it's did. called I'm Okay. What is it? I'm Fine. No, wait, wait. I'm okay. fine. It's how you say it. Oh. I'm fine. <laughs> yeah. And it's and it's a senior bathroom book. Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. it's not it's not a book about old bathrooms. No, no. Uh, so no. tell us a little bit about your book. What's it all about? I started writing stories a long time ago that didn't become part of my stand up routine. So just stories about this and that. a little longer stories because I'm a woman and um, tried to make them humorous and uh, short. So I had a number of stories written and then I added to them through the pandemic and refined the ones I had. I have a friend who used to edit a magazine. So I sent her every story and she would say good bad or she'd just say no <laughs> and uh she was great so i just went through it and when i had it published in edmonton i just said don't edit it if there's any little error oh well because i just didn't want to change the style and then i just finished doing it as an audible book and i had so much more fun doing it as audible because it was more performance than reading yeah it was Love interesting it. yeah yeah here's a, here's another question from mts mts thank you so much for sharing your questions yeah. can you share examples of successful instances where humor was used to diffuse tension or resolve conflicts in interpersonal communication i tell you since the pandemic is over, people just spew out their stupidest things. <laughs> I sit in the um, hot tub at the swimming pool and people start telling me these nonsensical things. Like uh, one gentleman told me that uh, President Obama was a Nazi and like they give me all these stupid things and I just kind of use my humor at that point to just get out of it. There was a, a situation where we were at a group session and somebody was saying something really weird. And um, one of the ladies in the group tapped me on the shoulder and said, we're not supposed to talk about politics here. And so I just said, first thing that came to my mind was, what, are we just supposed to talk about our toenail fungus? And that diffused the whole kind of batting of heads that was happening between myself and this lady because you just can't change other people's minds about things, but you need to get out of it. Like, what's the purpose of having, um, we've got a very diverse culture of people who think all sorts of things, some of them strange, some of them not, but I can't let them get away with it, but yet if I start lecturing them as a school teacher, that's not going to work either. So right. I just kind of throw in something or change the subject or just go off on a tangent. Like, yeah. Is there a book out on that? 
<laughs> I'm sure there I, is. I'm sure there is, but I kind of just want to talk about the weather. You know, can't we talk about the weather? No, I don't want to get into climate change. I just want to talk about the weather. Oh, so, but the climate does change on an hourly basis. Yeah, so. yeah. Uh, you know, for, for, it's interesting because in workplaces, from what I've witnessed, a lot of our funny in the workplace seems to be more situational. It's not necessarily yes, sharing a is. joke like, did you yeah. hear the one about the cockroach who stole yeah. my pen? It's yeah. not, not yeah. those kinds of jokes. They tend to be very situational that somebody's making fun of something that happened, uh, something, yeah. and then and then we have a good laugh about it. Um, or, mm -hmm. or so we think. I mean, sometimes yeah. we'll do things like, for instance, restaurants, the plates hit the floor and everybody starts clapping and the poor server yeah. is there yeah. just super embarrassed by it. People think that that's cute that they clap for her, um, but the server I I've been there for front and center where the server actually mm -hmm. left left walked off the floor crying because she thought that clapping was yeah. making fun of the accident and how clumsy she was. Um, so I, I know uh, I've been accused personally. I know that I've been accused of crossing lines the line sometimes more, more so I think from my daughter. Like she'll literally say, "Dad, the line is right here and you just pummeled <laughs> over it." <laughs> So what, yeah. what 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 are some of the rules of things to avoid when we construct a joke? Yeah, well, going back to what you said about situational comedy, um, it's an in-joke. Everybody gets it because they were there. Um, you can't tell that joke on stage at Yak X because those people weren't there. And so a lot of humor in the workplace is related to what's happening within the group. So that's just something that flows. And there's always somebody who's quick witted enough to get it, you know, boom. And sometimes I can come up with the joke that day, but sometimes I come up with it later, but it, it's honestly just a, a flow a flow of chit chat in the workplace. But I mean, it's when you start picking at people. It can be a situation, but when you're picking at people and pointing them out, that it's going to fall flat on its face. Mm. That's so not what you're there for. Are, are there are there key ingredients that we should be incorporating when building a funny story? Like something happens and you're kind of just going through your mind going, oh, my God, that could be so funny if we put this context to it. Um, yeah. Are there are there any ingredients that we should be really kind of focused on? No, because everybody's different. I've got a sense of humor that's mine and you've got yours. And when you're telling something, you have to be um, all in to tell that story because it's part of you. And so any kind of formula you come up with may not work but what you do is you tell it over and over and then you find out what they're kind of smiling at and then you get big with your actions oh and then this happened blah, 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 you know so you are adding to whatever is eliciting a smile from those people that are your audience whether it's around the water cooler or whether it's in a presentation form, however you're doing it, you just kind of build on what the initial reaction is, especially if you're telling it again and again. Yeah, uh, it's yeah. interesting because as you were saying that, um, it popped into my mind that Scott Dickers, who's a comedy writer, um, put out his first book, How to Write Funny, and he uses mm -hmm. comic filters. And he's, so he's got 11 comic filters, which I always thought, to me, it was a great way of being able to kind of look at something and say, hey, what happens if I exaggerate? What happens if I do something else mm -hmm. with this information? Can mm -hmm. I, will it be funnier, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so it's interesting. Uh, wh how, do, how do you, like, how does it occur to you to say something funny in a situation? Because there's a lot of improv that goes in a, on that. Yeah, it does. I And it's the brain that's working that just kind of pulls it from somewhere. I, and I never know why I said it or how come. And improv is a totally different thing. And I was always bad at it because 
I have to listen to somebody else. I don't, I don't listen to other people. I just kind of in my own head. And that's why I, I went solo. And so if I'm on stage and I mess up, oh, well, it's my fault. It's not your fault. You're my partner in this improv game. It's my fault. Yeah. 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 And that's why I find interviews kind of weird because did I hear that? Am I listening? <laughs> Yeah, I have to keep catching myself. Did I hear what he said? Did I answer the question? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. You'll, you'll know it on the playback. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. You asked a question and I don't know if I, I, I know it. That. I know that in the speaking realm, uh, incorporating humor into presentations is really important. Even even much so, like even in like present sales presentations and that sort of thing. I, I think the t stereotypical question is, do I have to add humor to my presentation? And the response is always, only if you want to get paid. <laughs> That's but, right. I, but I'd love to delve into some maybe best practices for practicing funny stories and anecdotes. And we'll get to that right after this. <laughs> When you're delivering an important speech to a huge audience, it's easy to lose your place or go way over time. Give yourself an advantage with the Pro Speaker Presentation Speech Timer app. No more checking your watch or calling for time. The Pro Speaker Presentation Speech Timer app keeps you on track with easy to see timers, even changing color for visual prompts during your speech. And you can set audio cues to practice or set it to vibrate so you don't even have to look. Be the pro you know you are. Download the app at speakerpresentationtimer.com. Welcome back. I am having a absolutely fabulous conversation with Susan Carter. As you can tell, Susan and I are passionate about serving business owners and managers just like you. So if you are tuning into this and you're thinking, good golly, Mark and Susan, I need to train my people. Feel free to reach out for a quick discovery call. Our contact information is in the show notes. Uh, Susan, uh, for presentation and sales meetings, how do you strike a balance between rehearsing a funny story enough and over rehearsing to the point where it loses kind of that feeling of spontaneity? That's an interesting question because the way I remember stories or a, a funny story, I'm actually reliving it in my head. Uh, somebody asked me, how do you remember all that? And it's because I actually my brain is able to go back to whatever situation it was and relive it. Now, I have the confidence to do that now, but when I was first starting out, I, I would rehearse a little bit more. And when I rehearse now for a comedy show, I do spend time and I go over it, but I don't over rehearse it because that's me. But somebody else who's just starting out might want to rehearse it um, and have it word perfect because that will give them the confidence. Everybody's different in that form too. So you just have to find your style and what you do. And for me, over rehearsal makes it stale because a lot of my jokes I've done a lot of times. And if I mess up a joke, for me, oh, well, you know, it's like the women tell long stories. So this was just part of the long story. And then the next bit will be funnier. Do you know what I'm saying there? Yeah. Yeah. Sense. So you take the opportunity basically to just go through it and, you know, and then just give yourself grace that if it wasn't funny, it wasn't funny. Yeah. Move on. And, yeah. and I very early on in my um, presentations, I was in front of Mm. oil workers that were not uh, not very old I would say they're quite young guys and their significant others were there so I started getting heckled right away and I forgot my whole shtick I was just like a deer in the headlight in my head and then something said oh well they don't know what your jokes are anyway. So if you miss a few, who cares? Just motor on. And I got the audience on my side and we were good. It was just a question of you will get thrown a curve 
a lot of times you just have to say, oh, well, I was telling you before we started today about me doing a stand up bit and somebody started shrieking. And in my head, I'm going, I've never had that reaction to that joke before. <laughs> and it was a mouse running through uh, the room. <laughs> and I so the mouse should, stole the show. It did. Yeah, I should have brought the cat with me. And I never thought that I would need the cat at a comedy show. <laughs> there you go. But yep, you can it, put it in your contract from now on. Shut your mouth. Yes, yes. <laughs> but here's the whole thing. Um, you have to be ready for curves. And you've spoken before. I mean, somebody decides that the ice needs to be hammered down into chunks in the middle of your joke. Like, wow. A 747 decides to come through. Like, so you have to be prepared for that too, but um, you just go with the flow, shrug your shoulders and move on. But you don't ever show show the audience that you're upset. You just move on. Just move on. And, you know, and part yeah. of that is what how I overcame it. Number one, I had a great coach, John Vorhouse, who wrote uh, The Comic Toolbox, was one of my coaches. And one of the things that he told me is whenever you get up to the microphone, start focusing on what is it that you're not getting laughs on. And I thought, wow, that just kind of took the whole pressure off because, of course, in your mind, when you're saying, I'm going to get up yeah, in front funny. of this group, I'm going to kill yeah, it. Funny. And, of course, you don't yeah. kill it. You go into panic mode. So it was a great way yeah. to be able to look yeah. at it and say, well, you know what? OK, that didn't work or parts of it didn't work or whatever. Uh, MTS has one more question. He says, uh, oh. thank you. let's see if I can make this bigger so people can see it. But thank you. My last question is... Uh, my last question is cross-cultural communication. How should one approach using humor considering that what is humorous in one culture may not be in another? That's interesting. So you, as whatever culture you are, can make jokes about yourself or your immediate family in that culture. Um, you're trying more or less to portray your culture to the rest of us. But uh, what you think is funny in your culture may be a bomb in ours, but you just say, oh, throw that out, move on. That's not working. Um, Laughter is universal. People who can't even speak the same language can laugh about things together. But I guess it's just a learning curve, right? What there's still with... there's still a shared experience being human beings, right? Maybe that's why bathroom jokes work so well. That's Everybody's right. We food. all go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what yeah. would what would you tell with somebody who says, "Oh, I couldn't do that. I'm just not funny." Uh, well, maybe you are. Maybe. Well, yeah. I think everybody's got a sense of humor. It's just different from one person to another, right? And and that's the whole thing, isn't it? Yeah. Was it Stephen Leacock? He said. Don't ever tell somebody they're not funny. That is not something we do. But um, <laughs> it's just some people are very dry and uh, subtle. And like you said, puns. And again, that's a language thing. If yeah. we're not both speaking English, somebody's not going to get that joke. Yeah. I did a show where... Um, Everybody in the audience was of a different culture, even from each other. They weren't all from the same country and their wives didn't speak English. And the second part of the show, I got up, I did this character named Helga, who um, told men where to go and how to get there. And I had been in communication with the bosses before and asked them if they would participate. Well, the gentleman that stayed in the room who worked for the company, because their wives went into the foyer and just started chatting. So that was a bonus because they couldn't understand me anyway. Plus, they wouldn't have gotten those in jokes yeah. that happened. But everybody was able to laugh at or with the boss because that kind of elevated their status. And it wasn't. A language thing it was a shared experience again yeah about yeah. their humor yeah so i mean to me that's the big takeaway for this from this episode is you know when you're looking at 
comedy within the workplace, humor within the comedy, you really are looking for shared experiences because that's how you build uh -huh. a connection and a context. Susan, this yes. has been so much fun. Do you, do you have any last thoughts about what we've been talking about today? No. No, um, <laughs> I have many thoughts, but you don't want to hear them all. I just, I just really think that people should watch the reactions of people when they're telling jokes. Was that something that went over well? And seriously, write it down if it did. And if you're in a banking situation and you have shared experience about banking, that's what you want to focus on if that's your audience. Because yeah. I tell teacher jokes that just bomb out. If you're not in a teacher. A regular, if you're not a teacher. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so thank you so much for sharing your passion and and I love you know I love our conversations whenever we get together and talk about comedy and okay. humor. Could you remind everybody just one more time how they could get a hold of you? I, either through my email, which is sccomic at live dot com, or I do have a website, but it's mostly geared to teachers right now, which is Susan Carter Comic. Love it, and you also have you have a wor worksheet or a, um, a white yes. paper where somebody can can learn how to incorporate humor into the storytelling. Yes, uh, there's um, in the notes, you just click on that or copy and paste it. And, and what can they takes... expect if they download that? Uh, what it is is step by step, how to tell your stories and an example. I have an um it's not great quality, but it's a, a clip of my um, humor. So it's just Love a little, it. my funeral is what I call it. But it, it grows out of an experience that happened and right. how I got the story. Yeah. yeah. Susan, thank you so much for being such a great guest today. This has been Thanks absolutely awesome. <laughs> thank you. Why don't you let me know if this was of value to you? Um, as always, my offer stands. If you would like 30 minutes of my time to brainstorm your business with you and your team, feel free to book yourself on my online calendar. The link is in the show notes. It's the one that's marked meetwith.markhain.com. And keep an eye out on this channel and on my website because I'll be coming up with a worksheet of my own around the idea of how to incorporate improv into your workspaces and how do you how do you create and build relationships through improv so it would be my honor to be of service to you um, so please feel free to keep following me and please feel free to connect with me and of course if you've enjoyed today's episode why don't you go ahead and subscribe to this channel and leave a comment or a review i'd love to understand if this was of value to you um, what could we do better and is there, any, is there any kind of topics you would like to see on this channel? It has been so great being here with you. My name is Mark Hain. I hope that you stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope you dare to be the exception. Thanks for joining me today.